if you haven't hit the bar yet, now's a great time to start drinking. <laughs> Uh, as Hartman called last year, he brought a lot of work, sort of work. Yeah. It was a good, good group of concepts. <laughs> you know, any of, so, Internet of Things, 50 billion more devices, and I'm bitching about Travis taking. All right. Thanks, Wayne. Okay. So, really, I was looking at, okay, we've got all these different devices out there. And there's going to be forensics. What's going to be happening for this analysis? What's going to, what are people going to be looking at to determine what you are actually doing? How are we determining patterns of life? Give you a little um, background information. Army officer, I've been on active duty in the reserves. I'm uh, presently with a joint unit. Getting ready to switch all the way back to the Army full time, take command of the battalion later in the year. I'm the senior cyber architect for L3 Communications, so a uh, $12 billion company, also a research fellow with them. And I'm a board president for regional theater because that completely fits with all the technology stuff. Uh, but if you want to see some awesome social engineers, that's some great folks there. Uh, I do have to put the disclaimer out there. I'm not a spokesperson for any organization or entity, not for the government or L3 or anyone else. Uh, any tool or any you know, mechanism that you might use in any form of offensive capability is of course purely theoretical. Um, in the words of some of my psyop brethren, I would never be caught doing such a thing. Um, but also, uh, my employer said that hey, if you actually gave out something offensive, uh, other than just the content, uh, that um, you know you might be violating ITAR, and I don't want to go to jail or lose my clearance. All right. Um, so this is what we're going to go through. Um, some of you, I know, we got a few law enforcement type people in here. Or somebody, yay! All right, yeah. Okay, and we got a law enforcement and a lawyer next to each other. Awesome. I'm going out that door. Uh, there we go. So I was looking for what's a good definition of something that was really nice, light reading. That like Robert back there with the beard is going. Like, yeah, I'm not going to read that. But the important things, and this is a definition from 2003 about digital forensics. Awesome. Okay, so we got uh, preservation, collection, validation, analysis, interpretation, documentation, and presentation of digital evidence. All right, well, you know, it's a wordy definition, but the neat thing is, as, as I start looking later for how can I interfere with the forensics process, because it is a process, those are different areas I may be able to attack or interfere with, and if any of those don't work or they don't work well for people that are doing the forensics, then it's likely not going to make it all the way through trial. Okay. So really, when we're looking at evidence, there's going to be two types of evidence that are out there. There's going to be direct evidence. You know, what I can find, you know, I've actually got the logs. I've got data. I've got pictures of the person, um, you know, stealing the roll of toilet paper. <laughs> or I've got, you know, actual files. Other times I'm looking at, you know, there's in, inferred evidence. I, I know that something happened on this system because when the police came and they took all of my electronics, they could tell that I'd reset all my devices or I'd ran something to wipe the different the data on different devices. So, you know, definitely it'd been tampered with. Some of you I know have got government backgrounds, uh, familiar with the term uh, zeroized. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. And in case anybody's not. Essentially, that's uh, when you're doing the overwrites, uh, overwriting the data and the different structures, uh, may, uh, different standards sometimes, five passes, seven passes, however many, one times it's all zeros, or it's all ones, or it's random combinations. Um, some forensic tools, the way they, they will look at things are looking at a sequence of events. So if I can align all of the dates of all of the files on a system, no, they're no longer able to look at that for a sequence of events. Now they have to go through and they have to look at things individually and figure out what's in there. And really what I'm doing is I'm taking up their time or the resources, either on computing power or the amount of time it's going to take their analysts to go through and try and find stuff. Uh, same thing if you're trying to do something with file sizes, aligning or altering those. Um, whenever you hear somebody that they're arrested and they had uh, pictures of, of kiddie porn on their computer. 
a lot of the forensic school tools, what they'll do is they'll go through and they'll actually be looking at the hash values and the file size of all the different images on the computer, comparing that to a known list of evil things, and then they'll do some spot checking among that list, but the investigator doesn't have to go look at a thousand pictures on their own, which is good for them. Also, there's the in, uh, encrypted communications question. If um, Frequently, you, you hear it from different government organizations saying, oh, well, if you're not doing anything wrong, why do you need to encrypt stuff? Because. Um, so there. <laughs> so there's the but, and it's actually a big but. <laughs> and you did find the big but. I did find the big but. And I really regret that I forgot to use an incognito window when I was doing oh. Google searches. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, autocomplete in Chrome is just going to be sad for a little while. Uh, there's the question of, of legal or lethal. So when I'm considering how am I going to be stopping or dealing with forensics, and I've got a whole bunch of things out there, it's always easier to kill people than it is to talk with them, uh, especially if you're in Yemen. Um, but the, the <laughs> threshold, if I'm going to be doing prosecution or taking somebody in or dealing with them in courthouse, uh, there's going to be testimony, there's going to be witnesses, there's going to be counter witnesses. So that, that those thresholds of what did you go through and how is all that evidence there? Well, that's it's a lot harder uh, hurdle to clear than it is just to okay, I've established a pattern of life, they did it, and uh, GMARC is going to be over there, and um, the drone will come in through the window, and we'll have some Russian mobster guy combined with the crocodile hunter uh, speech writer um, talking about how he's going to take uh, GMARC out. So. Just because it wouldn't help you on your presentation. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. So the Internet of Things. Everybody's heard the term. What is the Internet of Things? Well, basically everything gets an IP address. Uh, traditional stuff, computers, laptops, tablets, personal things, your smartphone, your watch, you know, wrist mount GPS or portable GPS that you got in the car, uh, things at your house, the nest. How many people have a nest? Uh, yeah, I see. All right, see a few hands there. Awesome. Uh, TVs, refrigerators, other items. Uh, nest is a Arduino powered thermostat. So it does all sorts of neat learning stuff. Google acquired the company, so that gets pulled in with all the other great information like hippo butt searches that you've done. <laughs> and and that, that all gets compiled to help compose this picture of, of what somebody is and, and what they're doing. And help set market rates for your electric service. And they, all, they also now have got off that smoke detector sensor. And they all have sensors on them so you can, when you walk by, it also gets your patterns of walking around the house. <laughs> yeah, so where you are in your house at what time? That's, Did you buy that radio yeah. shake? If Radio Shack was still in business, yes. <laughs> but, uh, as of about 2.30. Uh, and, and something I had when I was looking at, at some of this earlier, I was like, oh, okay, well, so let's say I've got some Nest devices or I've got some other things, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a, a different username with uh, Google, and, and for those Google services, I'll run it off a different wireless access point, and um, all those devices will communicate through that. I'll run it through Tor, and then it'll exit, it'll talk back to the Google Cloud, and they won't have to associate any of those devices with Travis. <laughs> um, but, the big part again, I think that most of those devices are highly likely that they're also registering which other um, wireless devices or wireless routers are within range. And because they can see the other wireless device or routers devices in my house, and the Google vehicle has made a couple trips through the neighborhood, it's then able to say with a very high probability, yeah, you know what, I think this router is in the same house or within you know, 50 yards, so this other person probably is Travis. Yeah, there's a little tool called Honey Badger, which will go ahead and do that, and it's just running Java, and it gets you to figure it out even through Tor and geolocate you using this about 50 to 70 meters. John Strand uh, and his group have written over Black Hill Security, kind of fun to watch. Excellent. And that's close enough to get the predator to come visit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, police, 911 systems, what they're using for their dispatch, 
smart guns, we're starting to see things getting closer with that. Uh, body cams, dash cams. What I've seen on some of the body cams or a fair amount of them, they're all getting the data files dumped back to a central location, cloud storage, and multiple police departments. It's all stored in this one giant repository, uh, replicated wherever else. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. And I haven't seen any court challenges on it yet, but if somebody's able to tamper with one police department anywhere and what happens where their data stored from the body cam, hey, they replaced six frames of footage in this one video from you know, Podunk, Kentucky. Please tell me there's no Podunk in Kentucky, but um, and they, uh, there's Paducah. But, you know, so I was like, yeah, I'm from there. I hate you. <laughs> but you know, if somebody can show that system was tampered with from you know some police department thing, then it brings into question everything else from all those other body cameras in Los Angeles or New York or wherever else. Well, they've already had LA systems where they were tampering with the antennas so that they could create reception so they could be off coverage. And well, if they detect if they detect that it was tampered with, that's a totally that's a totally that's perfectly fine because you know that you throw that evidence out. It's the detection with it's the tampering <laughs> without detection where you get into a problem. I both of it's actually a problem because then you then the integrity of the rest of the um, information goes into question. And at sure. that point, it's it's all tainted. It, it, a judge will throw it out like that. Yeah, but the thing the thing is, you don't even have to taint it. If you could just steal a couple of those files and post them online, it calls into question their whole security program and everything else, and it and it and it causes major problems for them. Great. And as long as we're not in Yemen and we're dealing with the legal threshold, yeah, you know, that's a great thing. So. Yeah. I mean, anyway, can I stop dash cameras and can I stop body cameras? Well, probably not. I could probably be doing some broad area jamming if they're you know, sending it back that way. But if I can cause the legal validity to be questioned just by going in through somewhere in Kentucky, that's an awesome, awesome thing. Cars. Anybody have an idea how many computers are in a modern car? Yeah, 80 something. Wow. Yes. I don't know how many are in mine. 60 to 80 something, 1960. I, I read the DARPA report. I think it's yes. Yeah. You know, last year there were people talking that there's 70 plus. So yeah. yeah, 60, 70, 80. That's a lot of different computers. And there's, it's really kind of disturbing. They've got both the the CAN bus is running the different systems on the car. Um, some people may have heard about the Toyotas that didn't respond to the brakes uh, a couple years ago, and, and there was a lawsuit and recall around that. The well, the most vulnerable vehicle they've proven is they think is Jeep Grand Cherokees. Okay, I haven't heard uh, anything particular about the Jeeps. I know uh, some vehicles that people have been able to get in and tamper with them through like Bluetooth, uh, the wheel sensors, tire pressure sensors. It's going to be. It's going to be a. It's going to be a presentation at DEF CON this year where they're going to show that they can do that wirelessly and stop the car. Well, and what's interesting is and if you look at some of the previous years at DEF CON, somebody was using uh, a dash cluster from a mini to try and display the time. There's a lot of research that keeps happening, and it's all this primary research of what does the data forms look like on the, the data bus for a Lexus or for a mini or for BMW. And Researcher A does it, and they figure it out, and then they'll they'll maybe share, uh, you know, with a couple of their colleagues or a couple of people at the same university. But there's not like a common database or a common repository where people are able to go to and say, you know what, I'm I'm working with a, a Chevrolet uh, uh, you know, Corvette, and I want to be able to go in and see what data buses and what data files, and actually figure out what's there and what's been tampered with things. And since there's not published um, information on what those data structures look like, uh, what they actually mean, what the different headers going across the bus. It makes it very hard for people to go out and actually do repeatable things with the forensics. Uh, what is kind of nice about that, though, is if you are an attacker and you have done all that primary research, you can go in, you can tamper with the system, and it's very unlikely that somebody else is going to come along later and figure out what you did. Industrial control systems. Uh, I've heard that Iran had a little bit of a research project with that. 
Anyway, I think it was Purdue. Um, and then, of course, octopuses, penguins, people, warthogs, yaks, newts, walruses, wildebeests. Does anybody know where that line comes from? Yes, octopuses, penguins, rats, bats, cats, and especially rabbits. Tasmanian devil, bugs bunny. <laughs> Everything gets an IP address. Okay. All right. Even the ponies. <laughs> yes. That is so wrong. I, don't know, I didn't see it there, but medical devices are starting to. Absolutely. Medical, medical devices, medical, medical technology. Um, Travis, how are you going to keep your vetting on deviant art? <laughs> <laughs> My search history is just messed up. <laughs> <laughs> just walk away from the laptop. Yeah. You know? uh, yeah, after a while, I, I, how do you know that's not a channel distribute killing pool? <laughs> it has an Alexa rank. Yeah, uh, who knows? But um, <laughs> yeah, well, I guess one other way you can deal with the forensics is I'm going to have so much stuff that the examiners really just don't want to look at anymore. <laughs> Hippos. I mean, when the Secret Service many years ago was doing some work for the Electronic Crime Task Force, and they have a manual now, and they had it back then, but when they go into your house, the Secret Service FBI, they're actually looking for the Internet of Things to try to pick them up and take them with them for investigations. And you know, I think that's. You know, interesting because a lot of warrants are like go to this house and steal all their computing devices. I mean, seize all their computing devices for malware. <laughs> well, okay, if my refrigerator and my washing machine, um, <laughs> the hot water heater, and whatever else all have IP addresses. Your car, you just rented my house and have a Yeah, you know, and come on, well, crud. You know, I hopefully I've got a tent or there's an REI nearby because the house <laughs> yeah. is gone. Having an affair with the soul. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And the uh, light bulbs. Uh, and actually, I have, yeah, I have seen light bulbs themselves, not the fixture, but light bulbs. Compact uh, desktop XP. So, like, yeah. I uh, that long ago where a medical device was actually compromised and used to deliver payloads. Awesome. Well, there was the there was the pacemaker that was running Android with a whole booster stack. Yeah. There was the radiation yeah. emission five yeah. yeah. delivery. Because no one, no one security those devices. Well, in any device or any technology, whenever you hear somebody say, "Well, who would ever attack that?" <laughs> you you automatically know. Oh, you know, great. That's awesome. Uh, Samsung a, a few months ago, they uh, they kind of got busted. Their TVs they were doing voice recognition, but it wasn't like you say, "Oh, Samsung, find the Sci-Fi Channel or you know, CNN, whatever else." So everything you said within range of the television was being sent to their servers for analysis. <laughs> no, Google. No, only if you had the smart the smart TV option in there. Yeah, because I'm sure all the options when they're disabled, they function completely correctly. All you need on the TV is Robert De Niro said, "You talking to me?" <laughs> <laughs> that solves it. So, so the, the sad part about that is I didn't have a Samsung TV because I live in Maryland, and in Maryland, it's a it's a two party consent state. So you could have sued them out of existence over that. And you know, anybody who lives in Maryland, it's really I'm telling you, the statute of limitations is not on North Carolina. People who want to mark your I don't know. So if you do I have Samsung TVs everywhere that are to the internet. There you go. If you do live in Maryland and you have a Samsung TV and it was spying on you, um, please sponsor next year's info war con. <laughs> March going on in Baltimore for you guys. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, I've lost my. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. Because I also heard that they might have been using the camera to see when people were in the room and when they would walk away from the commercial window. They were doing that with cable boxes. Oh, so Samsung is into revenge porn. <laughs> <laughs> so you were watching this one channel for five minutes, and then you left to go take a nap. Right. We may have some pattern of life things there. This, uh, you know, and if you take a look at the slides later, you can see more in depth. But this is just an example of some of the settings uh, from one control system for one computer or one car. Um, this is actually like for 2000, you know, you know mid 2000 something BMW, and this is one of like 10 screens to be able to go in and change different settings. So what are we going to do? All right. So we could avoid everything like the original hipster. Go live in a cabin in the woods, get a manual typewriter, send notes to universities and airlines, <laughs> along with gift packages. Drink PBR. Hippo Bust and Ted Kaczynski. What more than that? Oh, this because Google's going to go by with three and he'll hit you. This is awesome. I, I wonder what your Amazon recommendations are going to look like. <laughs> Pressure <laughs> sisters. <laughs> I did buy the Practical Pyromaniac last year, <laughs> and the Amazon recommendations after that were amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right. So I just have a few slides. Ultimately, we're going to have to accept some level of, level of risk, and these slides are just uh, ex talking through um, ways <coughs> or, uh, that uh, Tor could actually be attacked. And there were presentations at DEF CON and Black Hat, I would say six, eight years ago. It may have been back when Black Hat or Death Con was at the Alexis Park even. But they went through all the equations and how many exit nodes you need to be able to monitor to have whichever level of assurance of whatever was going on. Ultimately that means if you're just worrying about what's going on with the, the traffic, yeah, somebody's gonna figure it out. Cool. Uh, everything's a target. Uh, last year we saw different devices were being used for Bitcoin mining. And well, they found it was okay, some DVRs were getting popped, but they had such little processing power, it wasn't really turning anything out useful. But with Bitcoin, you're actually having a race. It's whoever's going to get through one chunk of calculations at a time. If I'm not doing something where I'm actually having a race, I just need X number of processing cycles. Well, then that DVR starts to become interesting to me. Okay. So some of the things that we want to do is we want to make sure we're trying to avoid stupid human tricks. Because users will actually do you know anything we want to do. Uh, we know when we're trying to avoid something or deal with anything with electronics, and we make the assumption there's going to be no major changes in number theory or mathematics, um, no major changes in processing power unless I'm able to scale. Okay, so now we're going to take a shot. That is a fantastically detailed number <laughs> How can it be fire without fingers? Well, it doesn't actually, I don't see an actual trigger guard. So, it's one of those little rings that you wear that engages a special hardware. Yeah, that little magnetic ring thing. But the pony's got ear protection and eye protection. <laughs> How much better is that than the different senators you've seen whenever they've been talking about an assault weapons ban? I would trust that pony. You have, you have issues. You definitely have issues. Share the pony. Okay. So, you know, somebody looked at a little bit of what's going on with the. Uh, you know, how, how forensics would be used. Uh, some of the concerns, I think, from a user, concern about privacy, uh, avoidance of identification. You know, I just want to be able to go search for hippo butts without it having been, you know, the, or maybe I want to avoid the embarrassment of I, I searched for hippo butts. Uh, I, I want to, maybe I'm wanting to avoid that there is evidence that I've tampered with devices, that I've actually went out and I've tried to erase things. Because, like hippo Yes, um, but you know, if right to be forgotten. Yes, 
you know, the right to be forgotten, or if they come to my house and they take a bunch of things, I don't even remember what I was experimenting with with that old server from a few years ago. I'm, can I you know, get a shell on this server using this tool or something? But under the, the right um, you know, prosecuting attorney, they might say, oh, well, he's got these evil things here, and, and he was trying to do stuff, and he was trying to go in through <coughs> power line networking and get into the network house because they're all running Zigbee, and there, there wasn't another um, you know, transformer between uh, his house and the neighbors, so he plugged into the network, and he could see the neighbor's house. I honestly, I don't know what stuff is on there, but some prosecutors make the case that all this stuff was being erased, so he's clearly trying to hide something. Uh, or we've seen his search history, and we wish he had tried to hide something. Uh, so attackers, attackers be concerned with, I mean, looking at systems. Wait, how, I, I, yes. I want to go back to the privacy thing yes. for a second. In sometime in the last couple, three years, I've heard allegations of certain research that as the smart meters and all that stuff gets connected and all the Zigbee and all yada, 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 that there was some research done that alleged that uh, by monitoring the power lines, I could tell the difference between a vibrator and a refrigerator and a microwave. And using that as a privacy invasion is the, where, what do you know on that space of privacy? He's a tension vibrator. Um, He's a metal one, not plastic. <laughs> well, they, they've so, actually used, law enforcement's actually used that to determine if you're cooking meth or whatnot in your house based on the amount of microwaves. Okay. I, I'm sorry, because not everybody can hear the comments. So it's like, Probably a good thing. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I'm sorry. I've never had considerations for Tempest and vibrators. <laughs> <laughs> it does reduce unwanted emanations, however. <laughs> <laughs> I think that actually may be uh, banned in the United Kingdom. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can say that this is is without my alcohol. power company, they have a smart meter and asked for six months of data from my power company. They gave it to me. And I did a correlation between my patterns, and they could, I could see spikes in my day where I moved around in the pattern, nice. what I was using to wash or whatever else from my power. But that's a privacy concern that has not company. been really addressed enough from the things I've heard. about it like six years ago. There was a privacy issue. So, so, so two quick questions just to kind of piggyback on this. One, who's your power company? Yep. Well, it was actually a little bitty small power company in North Carolina. Okay, and uh, second, what's their interval? And, and the problem with the, the it was UCSD, I believe, that did the study. Uh, the UCSD study, though, they, they were taking an interval data that was so small that you could literally detect microsecond uh, transactions. Yeah, I'm, I'm remembering something that was out of either Holland or Germany is my recollection. Okay, but the, the thing is most of the power companies have much longer intervals because frankly they can't, they're not bandwidth to pull in off the Well, they actually, like Duke Energy built a large data center, a large service provider built them a data center and sold them all this data center and stuff to house all this data from the smart meters that they don't know what they're going to do with yet. Right. Yeah, no, that's absolutely well, true. But it's just <coughs> how much how much bandwidth <coughs> you consume in pulling it out. Yes, but I just want to know that somebody moved the goalpost on you. Uh, somebody posted about a hippo porn dream. <laughs> <laughs> and the Urban Dictionary defines it, I think, redundantly. Awesome. Awesome. I just did a Google search on Travis Hartman's search history. Oh my god. <laughs> I bleach. Your hair just, just went like that, didn't it? Okay. Uh, so you know, a couple of takeaways about it. If the power company is monitoring or if you're using Zigbee devices, other things, you're trying to see maybe be able to see what's happening with your neighbors. If there's um, when large electric motors are turned on, there's the inrush current, and so you can tell by those spikes. So if I had three houses on one side of a transformer, I could I could probably get a, a pretty good feel when somebody's large device air conditioner or something kicked off. Um, if I had the more fine tuned where it's doing the data sampling, and then it begs the question of how is it doing that data sampling and sending it back upstream? 
and it's probably going back through the power lines and can my neighbor now monitor it because it's one thing if that data is going back there and due to the really narrow sampling rates the power company doesn't care they're only going to save once every 60 seconds or once every five minutes but if i'm using my washing machine and the microwave at the same time i don't want uh, my neighbor to know or you know it's well let's just go there i mean now that it's legal it doesn't matter that they can detect our hydroponic growing lab it depends on this yeah, but see, let's see what they're going to do in the future. This is where you don't understand. All this stuff with the smart meters, where it's going is eventually they're going to have pods, home area networks that are all these intercept these devices on your network. And a power company will be able to, and my mother-in-law already has this, and she's in her 80s, and she they can control her hot water heater and other things in her house. They pay, they, they're giving her a reduced rate to do that. And that's where this is going. These meters will be controlling everything else in your house and be able to send signals to it but you don't have to you know say i'll allow you to turn my ac off when there's a pass when there's a power spike or something so so you heard it here first <laughs> 20 years from now here's how things will, are going to work at least 20 years i think this is this is the 20 year prediction right <clears throat> within in 20 years you'll authenticate a device to your meter okay we'll be charging you by the device you'll have a flat rate for each device that you're purchasing and plugging in. Um, that's, and, and that'll be ultimately the end goal, the end state. So imagine you're, you're not being charged by volume of consumption anymore, you're being charged for this thing that has an energy efficiency rating. And we charge you based on the energy efficiency rating, it ends up being flat rate. Have to be done all the time. Yeah. 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 The other thing that I can see actually is that I, 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 I will, you go to the airport. I'm telling you now, it's automatically getting going. Right down, Spencer Wilcox said, 20 years from now, that's the way it will work. I'm gonna, I want that bet. All right. Yeah, you know why? Battery and solar panels. I want to see you around to collect the power, power, and I don't care about selling it back. Move fully off the grid, Win. I'm, but, I'm, but I'm gonna. I got Elon Musk meeting. helping me. Yeah, it's cool. So going back to the original hipster. So what are the terms of that patent? <laughs> so, Let's see, but by 20, in Montana, there you go. Yeah. You will be. Yeah. But I'll still be selling. Still yeah. well, yeah. 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 That's a good beer yeah. So, yeah. awesome uh, on you know, the, the 20 year predictions. I think what would be more so right now you go to a lot of places and you have an electric car or however and you can plug in and you know it's it's a draw that you know, that's a terrible pun but it, you know, it's a draw some companies have for oh we want to show that we're a green company so we've got five charging stations for our employees never mind there's 800 that came into this building but we got five charging stations aren't we an awesome green company that's put in the marketing marketing literature well you know, and, and it's essentially free when you show up to plug in your car. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you're talking about you know, device registration is you register with whichever power company and whenever you go plug in at a station or a parking they're, lot they're or a shopping doing center. That. They're already doing that where you can plug in with a power company and they charge your bill to you know, see it. So where we are, so awesome. All right. So I'm talking about uh, tamper evident. I want to try and change things on the different devices that I have. Uh, some of the concerns I need to be able to do if I want to delete that. If I really truly want to de delete data and not just smash it with a hammer, uh, I need to have some pretty in-depth knowledge of what are the file structures are, data storage mechanisms, and, and storage replications, and how, or storage, uh, you know, the locations and how it's replicated. Uh, most of you probably saw a couple months ago where uh, multiple people in Hollywood had their nude selfies that were exposed. And they were like, well, I didn't realize that my phone was automatically replicating my you know, iPhone photos or Android photos because I deleted it on my phone, but it was back there on my cloud account, which um, maybe why the Macs are still working is they're, they're, you know, Apple's trying to get through that thing where you could run a script and it and essentially brute force authentication because it never locked people out. Um, 
Yeah, so if you don't know where it's stored or where it's replicated outside of your, your home or on that device, it's going to you can't clean up all the copies. And that will leave conflicting information or somebody will be able to find the true information if they are going out and doing the forensics. Uh, the data storage mechanisms, uh, in particular, I've seen in iOS devices, um, Android devices, as they went through different file structures, the uh, uh, what actually gets deleted or where there's uh, settings or pieces or fragments of data that are stored sometimes it's like okay well it actually did a secure wipe of all my text messages but there was a cache that had the preview of all those text messages that were that showed up on the lock screen and it didn't do the wipe on that so even though i did ran the tool located uh, the text messages because i didn't know there was a cache i didn't uh, clear everything out and somebody can actually go back through and find that I already talked about overriding data. Uh, now, the interesting thing I was thinking about was, what if I start introducing conflicting data sources? I can't get rid of everything. I can't change everything. But if there's stuff that I can change, and it brings in enough, enough of a, a question, uh, I wouldn't do this in Yemen, but I would do it in the US, because in Yemen, I've got a lower threshold, oh, he's bad, shoot him. <coughs> Uh, but I've got two data sources, and according to the court, they're of equal validity. They're of equal levels of trust, and the tools and the techniques that law enforcement's using to get those, they're equally well, well regarded. But one says A and one says B. Well, does not beyond a reasonable doubt. So there, you go. and that's. Um, and that's the big thing. So if I can just introduce enough of a question into the system, it doesn't get rid of the, what the heck was in the guy's search history? This is a little bit freaky. But it does say, you know what? I can't get a conviction anymore. And so th that's going to well, be... Maybe. It depends on all the other collaborating and evidence. Well, but again, it's that legal standard of creating enough of a doubt to, to show you know, especially for conviction, you need to have that 100%. Well, now, if it's in a, it's, you know, it's a civil, of the evidence that well, but it, 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 in it, a civil, that's a civil, but in a criminal, you have to have beyond a reasonable doubt. But if I, you know, traffic ticket, you only need preponderance of the evidence at 51%. Yeah. So it's the, the level that you need in a criminal matter versus, you know, civil or, civil, civil or infraction type of situation. And in criminal, you don't have to prove your innocence. The prosecution has to prove your guilty. guilty. Yeah. Yeah. And if I've got this person that's examining the evidence from my DVR, my refrigerator, and my television, and my thermostat, <coughs> and they, they come up with, you know, two things say I was home, two things say I wasn't home. Discovery Channel, I believe. Yeah. And you know, then I, I'm going to be able to actually what I would be doing is I would be challenging that person, or my lawyer would be challenging that person, well, how come you couldn't make a determination? Or what other data sources? Are you sure you know how to use the tools? You're getting two different results. What is your training? What is? Are you aware of any time that's been admissible in court, you know, data from devices like that? Of the, of the smaller devices? Yeah. No. Um, I, I, I've, I know cars, the GPS systems, portable GPS. Um, there's um, some of the other data logging that, that's in cars, uh, acceleration. I, I think some of that's been in there. Um, but there, there's, you know, it's still going. Let's for a minute take it out of the court, right? Let's just, yeah. this is something that was brought up in, in another group, much like this. Um, uh, non attribution, of course, so I won't divulge who it was, but basically said, uh, uh, let's look at it for an insurance payment. If your refrigerator, uh, if your refrigerator keeps track of what you have and you have two gallons of ice cream in your refrigerator and it knows that you're eating this ice cream, but it reports that to your insurance company, your medical insurance company, and they know you're diabetic, then you they may choose not to pay for your treatment because you're not doing the things that you're supposed to do or life insurance or all those types of things. So it goes back into the privacy piece that Wynn was talking about in, in that conversation, but not having to pay on an insurance claim is a total different level of, of, uh, of proof 
because uh, it, it's just on a whim, right? right? So but the odds of the other okay. pictures coming out about the Affordable Care Act makes it all well, well, what I'm saying is where it's going. Not, not, but even with the, these devices like the NEST, law enforcement having the ability to even do the forensics on those, we're still not there. And so that's another issue that has to, that we're facing. I, I, would, I would say that there is already the ability to get some of that information, they could do the subpoena, pull some information from Google, be able to parse Google's data logs. Uh, and I, I've been I've been dealing with um, some forensics companies, going to forensics conferences for you know, ten plus years, and it's been really interesting to see. Like you know, the first time you know the iPhone came out, they're like, ah, it's got more stuff than this feature phone. It's got more than SMS messages. And then the companies came out with more tools and they get more in depth in the data structures and they find stuff like the previews that were really like, they continue to evolve every year. I think it's just another device that's going to go through that same cycle. Yes. So, so you know, everybody's worried about subpoenaing the data or whatever. Yes. Why are you worried about it? What people are trying to do is to monetize the sale of that data. So, you know, talking about the ice cream and the insurance, right? Of course, if I'm the manufacturer of that refrigerator, I'm looking for an additional revenue stream. So I'm going to sell the the information that I've agreed to collect, or the, I'm sorry, that you, by breaking the seal on the plastic or on the plug and plugging in the refrigerator, have agreed to. Yep. And, you know, all of this now is, I mean, I'll show you agreement. Nest, Nest is selling, or you know, Google bought Nest. Yes. Google has all that information. They're selling it for a hundred bucks a record back to electric companies. Yes. Now, so. something I, I would throw in with that, um, an earlier thought I have is, okay, I've got this refrigerator. I see the hand. Uh, but I've got this refrigerator. And this is me two years in the future or three years in the future. I don't have it right now. But there's this refrigerator. And whenever certain things are depleted or get to a certain level, it automatically sends an order into the grocery store or whichever grocery delivery service. And that gets queued up and every Tuesday and Thursday it gets delivered. Well, I'm the only person in my house that happens to drink Diet Coke. And this refrigerator or Samsung model XYZ, um, within five minutes of a device or of a particular thing being removed, a can of soda, if it's the last one, it will automatically send a, the order in which will get added to the accumulation. Great, okay. So 2 a.m. on Thursday night, the refrigerator sends a message to the grocery store adding Diet Coke to the order. Well, they're you know, added to the other things where I'm the only one that drinks Diet Coke in the house. There, somebody can start trying to put it together saying, you know what, we think Travis was home because somebody took a Diet Coke out of the refrigerator at 2 a.m. And he's the only one that drinks that. So it was probably him. And we'll add that to those other things as I'm trying to build that preponderance of the evidence there. Uh, so, uh, so one of the one of the issues though is we keep running into the when we talk about vendor sales, we keep running into mandates being put on the utilities to have that kind of granular information for rate reduction, for emissions control, for all these other things, where there's no other way to drive those outcomes. Now I don't necessarily agree with it, but the argument being made by the utilities is unless they collect that kind of granularity, they're not going to know usage patterns to drive rate reductions. Now, we can debate that, but it's the argument. And so then it comes down to, are there other things I can do that help, you know, uh, eliminate that it was just Travis, or was it somebody else in the household, or well, do I have to have a roommate, or, and, and yes. My concern is, you know, the, the, the topic here is the seemingly, uh, you know, legal or, or dubious uses, but you know, the reality is the hackers. If there's ways for the good guys, there's ways for the bad guys. And what concerns me is when these things fall out of our control, uh, as they often do, right? And they get used in ways we never imagined they would be used. Uh, you know, sorry to go there, but you know, IBM and the Holocaust, the census and the punch cards, right? It, it's things get twisted that seemed innocent in the future into something else so uh, with that excited I'm, I'm within my 10 minutes uh, I've already got the, the, the warning hand signals from when uh, I've got a few scenarios I'll run through them real quick and then if people are having beverages later uh, happy to have additional discussions 
How many people grabbed a rental car or flew in to have a rental car this week? Okay. Okay. How many people plugged in their phone or connected their phone with Bluetooth? Okay. How many people okay. are having just relaxing time? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, what's interesting is whether it's Bluetooth or you plug it into the car, uh, a lot of times it'll pop up saying, do you want to sync your contacts? Do you want to sync your calendar? Do you want to sync all this information? Some cars will actually pull the information from the phone without asking. So that's a little bit spooky. Yeah, it does that. Okay. Um, and you can get special USB cables that, that don't have the data wires connected. So you're just getting power, which is always a good thing to have. But anyway, so let's say I came to InfoWarCon. Somebody else came in with me. We hopped in the car. And... Okay, I've been traveling all day. I need to charge my phone. I plug in. Oh, hell no. No sync. We come to the conference. We go through a bunch of things. We see some embarrassing hippo and pony pictures. <laughs> um, we have some beverages and discussions that go into the wee hours. And we go back to the hotel. And the next morning, get in the car, plug it in again, because I've got to plug in the phone last night for some reason. I'm putting something in the trunk. And my buddy's like, why is the music not playing? What are those prompts on his phone? Slap, 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 it goes away. I don't know it. He doesn't know it. But he just said, OK, and all of my calendar and contact information just synced into the, the car. Uh, with my company, I'm working on a $400 million proposal right now. I go back to the airport. There's somebody from Boeing that recognizes me and goes, that's the lead guy over there for this thing. It's worth $400 million. He's a dumbass that charges his phone in the car all the time. Um, and occasionally, he might, it might have been there. And they say, excuse me, a lady working here at Hertz. I've always wanted to have a yellow Camaro, because he's got a yellow Camaro, or that one that just got turned in. It looks clean enough. Um, Transformers is my favorite movie, because uh, Michael Bay, but just the way he does character development, it's so amazing. <laughs> so, uh, but, not Megan Fox, not at all. Yeah. So, you let, let, let me have a yellow camera. They go, oh, okay, you're a customer service order. Sure, go right ahead. Okay. What do we know now? Well, we know that all of my corporate contacts and my calendar and everything was synced up to the car. I don't realize it happened. My uh, you know, co-worker or whoever I went to the conference and we're sharing a ride with, he doesn't know that it happened. Uh, my company, who's probably also really concerned about the information, doesn't know that it happened. And so that is there. We don't know what happened. And then there's this ownership question. Do I still own my data? Does Hertz still own, does Hertz own it now? Or does the person that we're going that rented the car five minutes after I turned it in own it? Well, if they have the right tools, they definitely own it and they probably own, uh, you know, they're going to own a $400 million contract uh, in a couple months. Uh, this is one area I've been talking with Access Data on. They are um, supposed to be releasing an app. That's Overload calendar storage uh, a few times, and hopefully that's going to wipe it. Because I don't know the implementation in every single vendor. I don't know if that actually does take it out of uh, uh, of everything they had in the system. So it is one area where there is a tool that's in development. Okay. Uh, the uh, the guest compound worker, and this is uh, one I think that was actually in the uh, in the agenda. Uh, you're dealing with an automobile, but we had somebody like, okay, I'd like to really invite this person for a discussion. Uh, and it happens to be in a different country, they, work, they live in a gated community, they work on a gated compound, but I can see their vehicle. So I'm going to use that awesome thing that's being demonstrated later at DEF CON this year, and I'm going to do some reprogramming of that vehicle's computers. Because what I wanted to do is go in, and when the, it gets to a certain temperature, rather than turn the fan on, it's going to change the fuel air mixture It'll run terrible, and the person's going to pull to the side. So it's a nice cool day. I'm waiting at the gas station two miles away. They get off work. They drive. The car develops problems. They pull in. Some people in a nice van invite them for a discussion, and then uh, reprogram the car. And most likely, with the current forensics tools, nobody's going to know why this person pulled over, what happened, and the fact that the computers and, and have been changed on the car twice isn't going to be found. 
And, and that's kind of a spooky thing to that you know, we don't even have the tools to know that something happened. Okay. And I'm probably right at time. Awesome. Okay. So with that, I'll be around uh, later as uh, people have beverages and different interesting ideas. Uh, welcome your feedback. Like to learn about more things. And I promise not to do any searches from your computers. <laughs> <laughs> Advance to the last slide, real quick. Okay. Yeah, the fun with the burner device is having an old smartphone that I'm actually using <laughs> that on. Um, <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I found that picture of General Mattis. I'm like, okay, this makes up for the other search results. <laughs> uh, there you go. Thank you, Harry. Who's green laser?